Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. The Hebrew scripture reading comes from chapter 9 of the prophet Isaiah, who is giving to the people, who is giving the people, giving us reassurance of deliverance through the righteous reign of the coming king. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. To those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest. As people exult when dividing plunder, for the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Our second scripture reading is Luke's account of Jesus' birth, found in the second chapter, starting at verse 1. I invite you to listen to this reading as if hearing it for the first time. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the good news of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1816, Joseph Moore, a Roman Catholic priest, wrote a poem that most of us know today, although he wouldn't actually use that poem for another two years. It was on Christmas Eve in 1818 that, according to legend, Moore walked about three kilometers to a nearby town to meet with Franz Gruber, a school teacher and organist. Moore gave lyrics, the lyrics he'd written to Gruber and asked him to compose a tune for guitar because the organ at Moore's church had been damaged in a flood. 
Gruber took to the task in just a few hours, wrote the tune that with only a few changes has still been sung now for 200 years as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the writing and performance for the first time of Silent Night. This hymn has gone on to be one of the most famous, if not the most popular Christmas hymn in the Christian tradition. Silent Nights, recorded by Bing Crosby, is the third best-selling single of all time. White Christmas is number one. And there's something magic that happens at the end of the Christmas Eve service when we light the candles and we sing this song together. Something that people who only attend worship once a year, as I did growing up, you look forward to that moment because there's just something about that moment of time. One of the most famous stories about Silent Nights comes from what became known as the Christmas Truce. In 1914, the first Christmas during World War I, soldiers on the front line stopped fighting for one day, and they came out of their trenches, and they exchanged gifts, and they played soccer, and they often sang Silent Night because it was one of the few songs that everybody could sing in their own language. In other locations, it was the troops singing Silent Nights that stopped troops on the other side to begin singing it and then led them out of their trenches. Now, there were other truces later on in the war on Christmas Day, but they were fewer and more limited because executive officers forbade Christmas truces from taking place. We wouldn't want to start a war and have peace break out. <laughs> But I think that's really the point of Christmas and of Silent Night is to remember that we don't have Christmas because everything is great. We have Christmas because we're broken, because we fight with each other and we need something different to be offered to us. We need to, to know that not only is heavenly peace possible, but that it's available to us if we're willing to work for it. So for the past few years on Christmas Eve here, we've been looking at each of the characters that we find in the Nativity story and what we learn from them. But think about the passage we just heard from Luke and who would we find in that story. Is there anything extraordinary about any of them? I mean, they do extraordinary things, but these are just ordinary people. They're not kings. They're not wealthy. They don't have the best jobs. They don't have great educations. None of them went to Harvard. <laughs> they don't live in the most important cities of the Roman Empire. They don't live in the most important neighborhoods. They don't drive the best cars. In fact, I bet you their donkey was bought used. <laughs> it's a poor girl and her husband traveling at the worst time because Mary is due at any moment. It's shepherds living out in their fields. Ordinary people doing ordinary things in their lives. And yet they change the world because they allowed God to enter into their life. And they chose when God's glory shone on them to do something about it. Lisa Aldrich went to a grocery store to pick out a cake for a, a party and she signaled to someone that she thought worked in the bakery and she told them what she wanted to be written on the cake and asked if that they had enough time to do that and she was told that she was. She said the girl took the cake back into the bakery and after a, sh a long time, Aldrich said, she came back and presented me with this cake. And I looked her in the eye <clears throat> and said thank you before I even looked at the cake. And after looking at it, I nervously laughed and headed to, to the checkout. It didn't really matter to me what it looked like, she said. I thought people would think it was funny. But when she got to the checkout line, she said the cashier didn't think it was quite so funny and called the manager over and then other cashiers came over to see what all the commotion was about and they began discussing it and asking her questions. And then one of the other cashiers pulled her aside and told her that the girl who had written on her cake even though she had been told not to, because she had autism, had decided to do it. And she said, thank you for smiling and thanking her. Even though she's not supposed to write on cakes, I think you made her day. 
Now, I can only speak for myself, but if I went to Smith's and I got this cake handed to me, I might not be as understanding or as accepting as Aldrich was. I probably wouldn't even hope that somebody else would find it funny if that's what I brought back to the party. And said I'd likely to be sending it back, and depending on the mood I was in that day, maybe expressing my frustration out on this young girl who had written the cake. Now, there's nothing wrong with expect, expecting a certain level of professionalism when we go somewhere. But where do we draw that line between professionalism and humanity? Between expectation and grace? Between responding how we want versus responding how we think God calls us to live and respond of letting God's light shine through us. Because I bet you if we asked Mary, she probably would have preferred not to get pregnant outside of marriage. She probably would have not preferred to have traveled 80 miles and then given birth as a stranger in a strange city. She probably would have preferred to have stayed at home and had a, a family in her own time and in her own way on her own planning. And I'm sure she preferred not to have had to flee, flee into Egypt to seek asylum in order to save Jesus' life when King Herod puts out a death warrant for her son. I'm sure she preferred this, this whole thing. It happened a different way. But when she finds out that she's pregnant, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on with favor on the lowliness of his servants. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God's grace has shined on me. God's glory stream from heaven afar, Mary is saying. And so I'm going to let God's light shine onto me and let God's light shine through me. I'm going to be blessed to be a blessing. And so maybe that Christmas truce in 1914 was a fluke. After all, the day before, the soldiers were killing each other, and the next day, December 26, they started killing each other again. But you know what? At least for a moment, the soldiers could sleep in a heavenly peace. For that moment, they were a little closer to what God's kingdom truly looks like. And maybe on another day, Lisa Aldrich would not have been as accepting of that cake as she was on the day she did get it. And maybe on another Christmas, Joseph Moore would have despaired about the fact that he didn't have an organ and he wouldn't have gone to have somebody else write a tune for a poem that he had written. But 200 years ago, he didn't despair. And 200 years later, we're singing that song. These were not big, grand projects sponsored by major organizations requiring thousands of people to bring them about. This was a few people or one person choosing to make a difference, to do something different in the face of adversity to make a difference just for that moment. Not worried about tomorrow or 10 years from now, just what am I going to do here and now? Of taking love's pure light and letting it flow through them out into the world. And why do we tell their stories? It's not really because they're extraordinary, but really it's how ordinary they are. But it mattered what they did, and in mattering, it becomes extraordinary. Earlier in our worship series on Silent Nights, I quoted from Marion Williamson, who said that God's light can be found in everyone. But not everyone is aware that they have God's light in them, or that they can use it. But she says, as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. As we let God's light shine in us and out into the world, we unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. 
And I think that's part of the magic of Silent Night on Christmas Eve. Because we start out with the gift of light in just one spot on the altar table. And then we begin passing around. One person passing it to another person, passing it on to another person, passing it on to another person, until everyone has the light. And while we all have individual candles, it's the collective light that, that lights up the room with the lights off that makes the difference. It's that light shining forth that's so powerful in that moment. And so if we take anything away from the message of Christmas, it's not just about angels and shepherds, about wise men and new parents. It's about us, here and now. It's about hearing once again that message that the angels bring. It's been repeated for thousands of years. That as the glories of God stream down upon us, the angels say, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David the Savior, who is the Messiah. Behold, I bring you good news. For those who have walked in the land of darkness have seen a great light, and those who lived on darkness, on them light has shined. So as we gather and we pass the light of Christ, and for the 200th time on Christmas Eve we gather and sing Silent Nights, let it not end here. May that light flow from us every day. To live every day like it's Christmas, like God's glories are streaming from heaven afar and coming down on us, offering us the peace and joy and hope and love of Christmas. May the light of Christ shine on us so that we may shine it out into the world. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen.